Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second presentation in PATH International's Special Education Outreach Series. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Connecting with Teachers in School Lessons. Our presenter today is Andrea Sook. If you are new to our Special Education Outreach Series, Andrea obtained her bachelor's degree as a learning behavior specialist from Bradley University. She has taught in both Illinois and Arizona as a high school special education teacher, where she also quickly developed the role of preparing students for careers after graduation. Upon completing her master's degree in transition through the University of Kansas, she became a transition specialist in Texas. During this time, Andrea completed more than 150 transition plans for students in both high school and middle school settings. Andrea has received distinct recognition for her leadership as the ACE, Architecture, Construction, and Engineering Mentor Group for High School Students, Mentor of the Year in Phoenix, the Walmart Teacher of the Year, Glendale, Arizona, and is a Target Grant Field Trip recipient. As you enjoy the webinar today, your line will remain muted. You will see printable resources in the handout section of your toolbar. We will have a question and answer period at the conclusion of the presentation. To post a question, type your inquiry into the question area of your toolbar. Andrea will address as many of your questions as possible at the end of the presentation. A survey will follow the presentation to help PATH International tailor educational resources to your specific needs. Without additional delay, please join me in welcoming Andrea for today's presentation, Connecting with Teachers in School Lessons. Thank you so much, Rachel. I just wanted to take a moment and specifically thank you and Kay and PATH International for allowing me this opportunity to share some great resources and knowledge on this topic. As Rachel stated, my name is Andrea Sook. It rhymes with book, which was a great way for high school students to remember my last name and hopefully not butcher it too badly. One thing that Rachel also uh, forgot to mention was that I am uh, PATH certified as a writing instructor and I am going on almost 11 years now as being certified through PATH, originally NARA. So as you might guess from this entire spiel about myself, my passion really revolves around supporting individuals with disabilities. I was actually a PATH instructor prior to even becoming a teacher. So it's always been my focus of how to help people with disabilities fulfill their own goals and wishes in life. So it's with that mindset today, we will take a closer look at connecting with teachers and school lessons. Quick agenda to review, we will discuss why we should collaborate with teachers and schools and specifically their lessons. We'll discuss different ways to collaborate, and we'll discuss different ways to connect with the specific lessons. And then to end today's discussion, we will also look at behavior management strategies that may be useful at your center, and also talk about general teaching strategies that can work in any setting. A few really interesting trends to talk about this bridge and connectedness between schools and where youths with disabilities spend most of their time and PATH International is that PATH does require certi certified professionals to include disability related topics as well as equine and discipline focused topics. So it really drives home this connectedness piece that we can't just be good and knowledgeable in one area, but we really have to have a knowledge in all of these areas to be an effective PATH professional. We also saw an increased number of people coming to talk to PATH International at the CEC convention, which is the Council for Exceptional Children's conference last year. And many of these special education teachers and professionals are interested in becoming certified in PATH. And then finally, many PATH member centers are directly linking with school programs and group homes again for this connectedness to look at the person as a whole person and everything else to be linked through that person. So a few things that I just wanted to touch base on before we go much further, because I am a writing instructor, most of the time, instead of using an equine activities 
assisted activities and therapies participant, I usually just fall back on the term rider. But please know that this could mean a variety of different types of participants at your facility or program. The main point though is that while they sometimes might be a rider and they sometimes might be a student, they're always an individual. So why should we connect with schools? This first question we're going to look at, and I've heard different debates on this topic. Some people feel that equine assisted activities and therapies should be a separate entity and no over overlap should occur between schools. And most of the theories that I've heard about this, it boils down to if a youth really enjoys the equine activities but not school, people are afraid they might tarnish the experience of the equine activity. But let's take a look at the other side of the debate on why we should connect with schools. The top three reasons for students dropping out of school who have a disability, need to support the family financial, years of academic hurdles and missteps, but the number one reason is seeing no connection between academics taught and real life. The number one reason is something every path center and professional can have an impact on. Additionally, more than 50% of 16 to 25 year old dropouts said they left school because they saw no point in it and no point in going on and didn't like it. Also, four out of five dropouts or 81% said there should be more opportunities for real world learning. So, additionally, kids decide when they're in the fourth or fifth grade if they plan to drop out of school. That is really scary. So we're not just talking about teenagers and trying to connect the importance to school to real life, but we really have to start making these connections much, much sooner, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth grade. So we need to try to make this difference before this age group and then to continue it throughout school. So what do we take away from these scary statistics? Yes, curriculum in school should be aligned to the post-school visions and interests of students and made relevant for their futures. But where do PATH professionals fit into this? Well, certified instructors and equine specialists in mental health and learning and PATH volunteers can all collaborate with teachers for the benefit of these participants and students. So let's talk about how we should connect with teachers. What do we actually do and what am I meaning by this? Well, it's quite simple. It is really just how to reach out to teachers. I would suggest that on all of your rider intake forms or participant intake forms, you include a section about teacher information, the teacher's name, what school, and possibly a phone number and email address. And you can reach out to all of these teachers and explain who you are and what your purpose is to contact them. During the last webinar, we also talked about having a school night at your center where you specifically invite all of the teachers from local schools to come and see what your participants are doing and have them show off their skills for the night. The main key, however, is to communicate and to brainstorm ideas for collaboration and overlap. Not only what can teachers do, but what also can PATH professionals do. Now, by no means am I suggesting to burden all of this on your own shoulders. What I am suggesting is to attempt to make the connection and see what you both can and have time to do together for the benefit of your participant and their student. So now let's look at specifically how to connect your lessons at your center and school's lessons. Now, reminder, this list is not going to be exhaustive. Instead, it is just the beginning or the tip of the iceberg, and hopefully this will promote a lot of communication specifically about specific writers and students on what you can do with the teachers. 
So the first one that I like to focus on in connecting with the classrooms is reading lesson plans. There's a few ideas here, many of which PATH professionals and centers have done. And the first is to create a book list for participants of all ages. And you can send this home with parents or just provide a location in your area for when students are interested in getting a new book from their library. I've also seen some centers have an informal library at their own location where a very informal bring books, drop off books, check out books system has occurred, but all of the books deal with horses, riding, um, equine therapy. So those are two great things that any PATH professional can try to do themselves. Now the flip side of it though is how do we connect with the schools? A great resource in every community is the school librarian. Her whole job is to make book lists and get books for the schools and of course to promote reading with those students. So a great place to start if you don't have time to make a book list yourself is to ask for their assistance. Now I will warn you they might not be able to do this the first week or even month of school but if you reach out to them, I think most of them would be more than willing to help you out. Additionally, many school librarians have a fund to purchase all their books from, and they must use that fund every year, otherwise it gets cut. So if you make this connection with the teacher and even the librarian, some of your books as recommendations can be put on that list to purchase and be held at the school for students to use. Now, I found the horsechannel.com to be very informative, but they did have a 30 best horse book list, and I have just provided some of the top ones that I recognized, and the first one being the Saddle Club. Now, many of us probably remember reading the Saddle Club when we were younger, but it's a great way to include an interest into reading. Think about our participants that may struggle with reading and really not enjoy this academic skill. Bringing in the horse connection can reinforce not only the importance of reading, but the benefit of horses. And both of these skills will be beneficial to our participants, growing their reading knowledge and also having more experience based on the reading with lessons with you. The next topic I would like to just talk briefly about is linking to the writing portions of classroom lessons. The first one is having participants create new stall forms. This is a really great way for them to learn all of your horse names, breeds, ages, etc. Even having contact info for the owners or your feeding charts or who the turnout buddies are. You can also have participants create pamphlets or brochures on your center. And then finally, looking at participants keeping a re weekly journal about their experiences or writing up a research report on a breed or a riding discipline. Now, as you can see, some of these suggestions are strictly school focused, like the research report. That doesn't really benefit your program or your center. But the first two, if done well, and possibly with support, can really benefit your center, and students would then have more buy-in to the real-life application of being able to write down this important information. The next one is linking to math. Now, I don't know about everybody on the line, but math was one of my least favorite subjects. But man, I'm telling you, if I would have had some of this stuff with my math teacher, I think I would have been a lot more interested. The first one is having participants create a spreadsheet on costs associated with owning a horse. I will be honest, I'm a little afraid to do this. I really don't want to know how much money is spent, but it is a necessary thing to do to be a wise owner of horses. It would also be a good idea to have participants compare and contrast different choices related to horse care, including the benefits or drawbacks of these choices. 
like owning your own land and having your horses stay on your own property versus boarding. Now, those are really big, complex areas of math. Some other areas of math would, having, would be having the participant use a pedometer to figure out how many total number of steps and calculate how many hoof steps that would be. Or you can do something like measuring jumps or distance between poles or the size of stalls. There are so many different math things that can occur at different locations. It's quite amazing. The horse calculator pictured on the right hand side of the screen is also located at the horse channel. But then there's also another website called horseloversmath.com. And I just pictured here a few of the work, one of the worksheets that was exampled on their web page on just different ways that math can be included on every single riding lesson or equine activity and then relating it back to again the skills needed to be successful in math. Now the next one up is about connecting with science lessons. And science lessons can be so much fun, especially when dealing with animals, because there's already a direct connection. The first one pictured on the top right is a dichotomous chart. And these could be really fun as an activity that you create for your specific site. And I'll apologize, it's a little bit small, but at the very top, the question is, is it a horse? And students have to answer yes or no based on basically the 20 questions game of what animal you're thinking of in your barn or your facility. So if the student says, no, it's not a horse, or you say that, then, oh, well, it must be Strawberry the pony, because she's our only pony here on site. But if the student answers, yes, it is a horse, or if you answer that, then there's a variety of other questions to get through. For example, is the horse taller than so many hands? Is it a male or female? Is it older or younger than X amount of years? And it all boils down to different horses in your location. Also, there's of course the skeletal and muscle diagrams and kits of horses. I have one pictured there and by no means am I promoting to go and buy these kits. They can be quite expensive. But again, bridging to the science teacher, the science teacher might have a budget to do this. Or additionally, many different stores will donate these types of kits to schools or to equine assisted activities and therapy centers for use for use with disabilities. I know I had 30 of these sets in my classroom at one time and man, I cannot tell you how many pieces of tape we were using to tape them all together. So it was pretty interesting. And then finally, another way to include science is looking at the lineage of famous horses or even the horses at your site. Could be a great way to really get students, again, connected with science, as well as what they're specifically doing with you or their horse. Social studies is always an interesting topic for me because it can be really difficult to relate things in real life to social studies, which can sometimes often seem like just history, but it, it's not always that way. A few ideas would be researching different regions from which breeds originated, or looking at famous horses throughout history like Sergeant Reckless and Secretariat. Why were they famous? And then looking at the role of horses throughout history and throughout different cultures is another really big one, and how horses were used. Again, trying to link horses and equine activities to what they're doing in the school so that there's a real world connection. We also have PE. And let me tell you, the PE teachers, when I shared this with them, with my group, were so excited to learn about this book, which has been around for, gosh, probably about 15 years, I believe. The Writer's Fitness Program, again, going back to the librarian, might be able to purchase this for the PE teacher at a school. And in it are all these different exercises you do on the floor, not on a horse, 
but to strengthen different areas so this way when you are on the horse, you have that muscle memory and that muscle strength to perform whatever skill you're working on. Additionally, the horse channel does have a section called Get Fit to Ride. And there they have different free little pictures, again, for PE teachers or even physical therapists to work on again at school off the horse. You could also do some of these activities before getting on the horse pre-lesson if you have any volunteers that have free time to do this with riders and participants. We also don't want to forget ways to include art. And art, I thought, was going to be a boring one when I first started thinking about it. Okay, we can all draw and paint a horse. However, it can go a lot deeper and in depth beyond that. Yes, you can paint a horse, literally, or you can paint a horse on canvas or draw a horse. But art today is now expanding into so many different things related to technology. So creating advertisements or magazine covers are all within the art field, but are now adding that technology piece. So again, another way to connect your center and your focus with the school for the benefit of your participants. And finally, music. This one was challenging because I am not musically inclined at all. Everybody would tell you that who listens to me sing in my car. But the Horse Channel does have the 30 best horse songs. And students can look up the lyrics to this so they can sing along. Some of the music teachers may also be able to access the sheet music so that the students can learn how to play these songs on whatever instrument they know how. And it might also be a way to add songs to different presentations on horses. Again, accessing that technology piece. Now just remember, some of these lyrics may not be the best for schools, like beer for my horses. So when recommending this with a school, just make sure that all of the lyrics are appropriate for youth. The next big area that we're going to talk about is behavior management strategies. So first, before I go much further, youths that may have challenging behavior may already have a plan that is developed by the school. Most schools will either call this plan an FBA, which is a Functional Behavior Assessment, or a BIP, a Behavior Intervention Plan. And with either one of these, typically, a behavior is outlined in detail, specifically noting any of the triggers for a behavior and any specific things to help calm the student down, avoid those triggers, or recover from, quote unquote, a meltdown. And it would be really important for any of your participants that have an FBA or a BIP to access this information, and you would need parent permission to do this. However, being consistent in all of the environments will only help everybody involved. It will make your life easier, it'll make the teacher's life easier, it'll make the parent's life easier, and more importantly, your participant will realize in any setting that they are in, they know what's to be expected of them, and they know what to expect if they do not reach that expectation. So the first positive behavior management strategy to talk about is the five to one ratio. And I really have not found many path professionals that needed to know this, but I wanted to make sure we did cover it. And it's basically every one correction or negative, you want to try to give five praise statements to that same participant. And that is just based on you're trying to find what the participant does well. You want to catch them being good. And like I said, all the, all the professionals that I have seen through PATH do an excellent job at doing this. But for the few riders who may struggle with behavior and find themselves getting more corrections than praise statements, we have to reverse those. 
Now, even more specifically on the praise statements, there's two different types. There's general praise and there's specific praise. But hands down, you really want to do specific praise. So let's look at the difference between the two. General praise statements includes things like good, awesome, way to go, excellent. General overall things that showing that they're doing a good job. But the specific praise statements take a little bit more time from you, but they also let that participant know exactly what they're doing right. So great job keeping your heels down. Good job sitting up. Wow, you're doing a great job holding your reins. An excellent job using that hoof pick. I really liked how you held your horse's hoof correctly. And this really guides them on exactly what they're doing right. Because as we all know, when we ride a horse or do a variety of horse activities, there are so many different things going on. So if a rider was in an arena and you told them, good job, so-and-so, they might not know if they're doing a good job sitting up and keeping their heels down and holding their reins. And maybe they're doing good at all of that. But maybe they're really slouching, but you are just trying to tell them good job with your heels. So they might not know, and you really want to be specific so that they can target which behavior they're doing well. And as, as I mentioned just a second ago, praise should be specific. But additionally, it should occur after a wanted specific behavior occurs. And unlike my attempt at an example, it really needs to be sincere. And what's great about praise and having so many different volunteers and adults and even youths, you can have the praise come from so many different individuals. Not only can it come from a riding instructor or a mental health specialist, but it can also be coming from the coach or a volunteer or another rider praising somebody else. So think creatively on how to get more praise into each of your lessons and how different people can be involved in the praise. Specific praise, that is. Now the other one that I would like to talk about is behavioral momentum. You might be thinking, oh gosh, what does this mean? <coughs> Excuse me. It boils down to building the participant's momentum to do something that the participant typically avoids. So maybe the participant avoids putting on their helmet. They don't like the feel, it's hot, it, despite being sized correctly, they just do not like this helmet. And I've seen various ways of either parents or volunteers or coaches try to overcome this, and here's another tool to add to your tool bin, so to speak. So start with something easy that the rider can already do, if we're talking about a rider to put on their helmet. So rider, can you please get your file out of the bin? And the rider does that, and you give them great praise, great job, thank you so much. Rider, will you please help the horse leader wipe off the chairs? Participant does that. Awesome, great job, you're doing great. Rider, can you please get the fly spray from the office? Perfect, the horses are really gonna need the fly spray tonight, good job. Rider, will you please make sure your boots are tied and your socks are pulled up? Good job, you are almost ready to ride. And as you can see, up until this point, the rider didn't need to wear the helmet but they were complying with all of your requests to do something that was within their ability to do. Once you get this momentum going, you then go, rider, will you please put on your helmet? Great job, we're ready to ride. So as you can see, it can be kind of fast paced and it's supposed to be fast paced, but it does have to be appropriate for the students. So you don't wanna just bark out five orders all really fast. You want to do them one at a time and build so it's a quick thing to get done with lots and lots of praise after completing each step because it builds the momentum of completing a task that you're asking them to do. 
So when you partner it at the very, very end for a task they typically avoid, this might help you overcome the hurdle to put on that helmet a whole lot easier. Now, additionally, to talk about for behavior strategies would be a preference assessment. And the preference assessment can be very simple and look like something pictured here. <coughs> Excuse me. And I would suggest making yours for different things or activities that you have available at your location. And you should probably also collaborate with parents to see what they are can and are willing to bring or allow for their child. So on the right, we have seven examples and the rider can fill it out themselves or the participant or people who have worked with the participant for a long period of time and know them well could fill this out for them. And here's some examples. My favorite horse in the barn is my favorite coach or volunteer is, my favorite free time activity while riding, I like to play whichever game, maybe it's Simon Says, maybe it's Red Light, Green Light. While riding, I like to use the toys of the basketball hoop, maybe. While riding, I like to ride forwards, backwards, or sideways, which one is your favorite? And I like my horse leader to be close or far away. And so as you can see, there's kind of a hodgepodge of questions here, right? What are we supposed to do with this? Well, keep that in the back of your mind because this, their answers become a potential positive reinforcers list for that participant. So if you're having riders complete a pref excuse me, a task that is really, really, really difficult and they really struggle that maybe two point. And finally, one day, the breakthrough is here. They were able to two-point around the arena the entire time when asked to do so. You really want to reinforce that positive behavior with the participant and with the rider. So you can go back, and you know that, man, they have a favorite fascination with black beauty, and somehow you have one black horse in the barn. And so maybe their reinforcement is they get to groom that black horse that day, or they get to pet them. Or maybe their favorite volunteer then comes over and works with them for a few minutes before going back to the other rider, whatever it may be. And it can also be used after someone stays on task or follows directions for a specified amount of time. So some of our riders who may have more challenges focusing if they have that reinforcement that they know that's coming to them, that's really, really awesome that they'll get to play Simon Says on the horse or they'll get to ride backwards if they hold their reins the correct way for one whole arena lap. That is just reinforcing the behavior that you're asking them to practice while in the arena with you. Now this also then relates to what's called the PREMAC principle. Now the PREMAC principle is all about timing. So a good PREMAC principle would be today, Johnny, let's say, if we steer our horse with quote unquote nice hands, then we will trot two times. And by saying this to Johnny before possibly even getting on the horse, your intent is to increase the desired behavior for the future. You want him to hold his reins nicely and to steer nicely. Now, if we do it incorrectly though, it can turn really bad and be considered a bribe, which is what we wanna stay away from. So if Johnny's already on the horse and he's already pulling really, really hard on his reins now, if we're trying to get him to stop, we could say something like, if you stop pulling harshly on your reins right now, we will trot two times. Now, again, this is considered a bribe, and we want to stay away from these. We don't want to do this, because at this point, you are trying to challenge the behavior that's already occurring, and you're trying to stop it. And that's not what the PREMAC principle is about. The PREMAC principle is always about increasing the desired behavior for the future. 
So before any of these behaviors, you want to tell the student what they're working towards. And typically they occur on an if-then statement. Johnny, if you do this, then this will happen. The final behavior management strategy that we will talk about today is self-recording. Now this is a critical component for goal setting, which will be a future webinar topic, but I did wanna share this one with you. And this is the self-recording is to choose one specific behavior for a student to track and graph. Now this is not trying to put more work on coaches or instructors or volunteers because it really is for the student. The student needs to know how many times they do things so that they have a knowledge and an awareness when they want to increase this behavior. So the first thing to do on self-recording is to identify a target behavior. And for some of your writers, you might identify three or four target behaviors. But for example, we'll just target one. And the one that we're gonna to target today is sitting up straight. And trying to make this a very visual thing for riders, the volunteer that walks with the rider could wear those pool rings that most people die for as bracelets. I've seen these in so many different arenas. I'm sure you have some or can get some on the cheek. But have the volunteer wear them like bracelets. And for every lap, that rider sits up straight and the, vol the volunteer will then hand one of those pool rings to the student or to the rider. And that student will put it on the saddle horn or they'll wear it like a bracelet or they'll have a little pouch to put it in. But the key is the volunteer hands the tangible ring to the rider. And you can pair it with a reinforcement. For example, if you have 10 rings by the end of tonight, we can play something off of your preference sheet. Maybe it's red light, green light. Maybe it's you can go visit your favorite horse in the barn, whatever it may be. Then the key to this is after the lesson, the student graphs how many rings they collected for that specific night. So maybe on that night they collected 11 rings and they put on a chart 11. So prior to getting on the horse the next riding lesson, they, somebody will need to review that. And maybe it's built in eventually that the rider reviews it themselves. Okay, last time I set up 11 times, so I'm trying to beat that number this time by doing 12 times or 15 times or whatever the magical number is. So again, self-recording, you choose one or more behaviors, but try to start with one. And the goal is to have the student track and graph the behavior that's targeted. All right, so moving on, some general teaching strategies. Now the first one, can work not only within a classroom setting, but also would work in any equine activity as well. And the first is the objectives. So first, what is your general plan for the lesson for all of your participants? And this should be based on the previous lesson and based on the goals that you want that group of people to reach. Then boiling it down, specific plan for each participant you have, again, based on the previous lesson and on the goals you want them to reach. And then somewhere, based on these two things, you will create, write, and post. That's the important piece, post these statements. So for example, after completing this lesson, participants will be able to hold their reins will be able to stop their horse. And the challenge is though for riding instructions particularly is to balance the physical action like stop or post or trot or to hold your reins correctly, to balance that with the knowledge piece. Are they able to recite or define why they are doing what they're doing? Or even just are they able to name what they're doing? And so when you post these statements, it's always good to review these objectives before each lesson and 
even consider recording these objectives in the participant files for the weekly or biweekly lessons that you see them. So you know which things that you had and which things you're able to complete at the end of each lesson. <clears throat> Additionally, many successful teachers use the explicit teaching strategy of I do, we do, and you do. And this can work for a variety of things outside of the classroom, which is why I'm sharing it with you now. The I do piece is to provide an example of exactly what to do correctly to your participants. You explain how to do this skill correctly, is the key word on this next one, with participants, and you show each step to complete it correctly. So this might mean, as with the example, that perhaps you take the reins from the cart driving horse, and you're gonna show them exactly what you're trying to teach them. Maybe it's hold the reins, maybe it's steer, but this is all about you, the instructor or the coach is giving the example and providing all of the explanation. And you don't wanna give non-examples of like, oh, well, don't hold it this way. You always wanna focus on just how to do it correctly. After you're done doing the I do piece, you then move into the we do. So then together you do the task. Maybe you have hands together showing how to hold the reins and you both have your hands on the reins together. And it's now at this step, when we're watching our participants, that we're gonna correct any errors that we see. So if we're teaching a youth how to pick up a hoof to clean hooves out, you might have to show them how to correctly lift and hold that hoof, if your horses don't automatically do that, right? And then finally, at that point, you move into the you do. And this is where participants practice that skill independently and you as an observer check their level understanding and mastery. Another just quick note about the teaching strategy is on using names and in group instruction. Now I would say most of us are pretty lucky that we don't have 30 students or participants in our program at one time for one lesson like a lot of classrooms do, but the principle still carries over. So there's three different types of using group names. First one would be, show me where the withers are, and then you give some pause, Johnny. And out of your three or four potential riders, Johnny points and touches where the horse's withers are. And then you can even try, Johnny, show me where the withers are. So you specifically state their name prior to what you're trying to ask them to do. So Johnny would come first. And then finally, you don't use anyone's name. You show me where the withers are, everyone. Now I would say for most of the lessons that I've watched at PATH centers, most people focus on the last one. Show me where the withers are, everybody because it's so great to have a horse leader or a coach or a volunteer right there so that every rider gets to experience that same question and have the opportunity to practice and answer those questions individually however if your riders are more independent or if your participants are more independent it may be more appropriate to start with show me where the withers are, pause to give everybody a chance to think about the question, identify the answer in their head before you specifically call on one person to respond. On the flip side, however, we do know that some youths with very specific disabilities might need that attention getting piece where you say their name first. So just remember to keep everybody involved in your lessons and use the best way appropriately for your participants. The last teaching strategy I'll talk about today is learned helplessness. And this one isn't actually a strategy, but just a good thing to remember. Now, learned helplessness is when all everybody else around you completes your tasks for you. So if a volunteer always gets the helmets for a participant, and their parents always tie their shoes, 
and the horse leader always stops their horse. And then a volunteer always puts away the toys that were used for the game today. From that example, that participant actually did not do a whole lot of things other than sitting on the horse, right? And after repeated times of this, these people and youths can learn helplessness. So eventually they don't ever learn to get their own helmet or they never learn to tie their own boots and they never learn how to stop their own horse. So consider ways where you can help youths become as independent as possible. And maybe they can't tie their boots and maybe they can't clasp their helmet but maybe they can always get it out. And maybe they can always say, yes, my boots are tied. So think of ways that you can promote independence in your own routine. And the routine is critical to build these steps into an own routine and hold those students or those riders accountable to doing that routine prior to getting on a horse or before they can get a reward that was from their preference assessment from earlier. Well, thank you everybody so much for listening in on this. Uh, now would be a great time for questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Andrea. That's a wealth of information for our instructors to incorporate into their toolboxes. We do have one question so far. Um, let's see, Sarah asks, like EAAT, the field of education is always evolving. Is there a resource for the public to stay up to date on changes? Um, I guess I would need some more information on if we're talking about the educational changes within the field or path changes. <laughs> um, both of them have slightly different responses. So changes in the therapeutic riding and equine activities and therapies field, I would say one of the most beneficial resources I have found has been the past newsletter. It's that short snippet, and here's kind of the nitty gritty of information that always links back to the website, whether it's certification changes or topics of webinars coming out. And then on the flip side of it with special education, I would say the Council for Exceptional Children. Um, they do require membership, unfortunately, and it can get a somewhat expensive. I think per year it's $120 for an individual membership, I believe. But they also send out almost, seems like, weekly emails on different laws that might be passing. And then you also become part of a group email where teachers share questions and concerns. And then this email opens up to a more broad discussion board where teachers and other members can respond. So if, um, for example, in the field of special education, one of the hot topics right now is suspending youths with disabilities under third grade. And so the CEC put out a discussion board to really provide what the language of the law might entail and then allow all of its members to provide comments and feedback on before presenting it to the legislation on making those changes. So I would say PATH and the CEC are two of the nationwide broad groups that would cover you in either area. Great. If you have any questions, remember that you can type them into the question area of your toolbox. We do have a question from Kim. When trying to encourage schools to send students to writing programs, does it help to share our lesson plans and sample behavior plans with teachers and school admin? What should my introduction include? So. I would say absolutely yes <laughs> uh, to should I share possible lesson plans. Um, absolutely. You want to show why this would be a benefit for an extension to what is typically considered the typical school day. Why will this benefit students who are also participants? Um, if possible, <laughs> I would also search out any grant sites 
and this could or different funding sites i should say and this might not be a national scholarship per se but even just businesses in your community that are willing to support this venture um, to pay for buses and potentially additional people from the school to go with students to your location so I would say as long as you present some really good clear objectives of what you want these participants to gain and then what will specific lessons look like and then is there a way the community can help fund this would be the top three things I think I would focus on to give you the best chance of having that approved. Perfect. I think that also answered Yvette's question on what kind of ideas for resources do you have for funding school programs? So very much along the same lines. Yeah, I mean, I, I know you mentioned in my little biography at the beginning, um, I was able to take a whole group of my students back in Phoenix to our local PATH Center, and it was through a Target field trip grant. And unfortunately, that was kind of a one and done type of thing. Um, but, and we'll get into this in another webinar a little bit more, depending on the ages of your participants, if they are more of the transition aged youth, which is typically from the age of 16 years old to approximately 21, depending on the student, um, there are some more funding options typically for schools um, for that age group of people, but I would also reach out to various businesses as well because one that gives a business a way to promote how they're helping the community and youths in the community if you want to establish more of a long time weekly or even monthly type of activity between a school and your site. Um, still along the lines of finance, uh, Gwen wants to know what kind of fee may be appropriate to charge school groups? Oh, I am totally the wrong person to ask, and I do apologize. We, in my experience, we've never charged fees for a school group. Um, whatever the group rate was to have your own lesson, like to have just someone from the public come and sign up for your lessons is typically what the quote unquote fee would be, and we would just hold it at a different time than when our typical nightly lessons would occur. Um, but the one and done type of trips, like with the Target Field Trip Grant, we did not, that PATH Center did not charge us a fee. We uh, could pay for the busing to get there and manpower to be there to support all of our youths, but we didn't actually have to pay the, the facility. So I know that doesn't help when we have hay and vet bills. Um, but I would say look at what the initial costs were for if anyone was to come off the street and seeing if you could be similar to that. All right, if you have any other straggling questions, feel free to type them in the toolbar or you can also raise your hand and we will stay on the line for just another moment. And I think that might be it, Andrea. So everyone, thank you for taking the time to join us today. We will follow up with an educational survey. Please take a moment to complete that survey so that PATH International can continue to produce resources to fit your educational needs. Keep an eye on your PATH International broadcast as well to be a part of the third webinar in our three-part special education outreach series, which will be scheduled in January. Until then, view all of our current educational opportunities in the PATH International online store and see what courses, webinars, and conference recordings may be best for you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.